welcome. This is the the prog panel, prog pal panel, right? Yeah. Everybody excited for this? More talking about prog pal. <laughs> ben, what do you think about prog pal? Uh, let's not go uh, there, dude. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's start off with introductions. I will, or we could introduce each other. I don't know. Um, no, I'm. I'm I'm Evan Vednas. I live in Texas. I uh, um, I found Ethereum, I guess, pretty early because it was sort of like what I thought the uh, like the vision was what I thought the internet was. You know, when I started using it when I was a teenager, once upon a time in the '90s. Um, and uh, I do a newsletter called Week in Ethereum News, which is hopefully on your screen, and it is weekinetheriumnews.com. So. Uh, I don't know. Should we go clockwise or counterclockwise? Depends on whether we're Northern Hemisphere or Southern Hemisphere, right? I'm in the Southern Hemisphere, so let's say counterclockwise. <laughs> I'm uh, Paul Hanna. I am a Australian, um, and I founded Sigma Prime with some friends in 2016. Since then, we've been working on uh, Ethereum exclusively, um, and we started working on uh, the Ethereum 2 specification right when it was conceived, and we still continue working on it through to now uh, when I am a lead developer on one of the F2 implementations Lighthouse. Yeah, I'm not sure if uh, that's going to go class, but sure. <laughs> I'm here in the Northern Hemisphere, uh, work for the Fair Foundation. Uh, I do uh, some research, but also uh, development. I help with a lot of tooling, integration of client things. Uh, recently, I added Taku to EF2 stats. I'm just like excited to work on all these uh, phase zero things. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Raul Jordan. I am the co-founder of Prismatic Labs, one of the teams implementing ETH2. Uh, we've been working on, on layer one scaling since the start of 2018, uh, back when it was just sharding uh, and has evolved into this giant ETH2 effort since then. Um, I'm originally from Honduras, uh, currently live in the US. Um, and yeah, I just uh, really, really, really want to see this come to fruition and we're putting everything we can on on our team side uh to get this up and running uh, very soon hey i'm ben representing the british isles um i am here i guess in two capacities uh one of which is um product owner for teku which is the eth2 client from pegasus the protocol engineering group of consensus uh also i uh, push out this uh what's new in eth2 thing every couple of weeks uh which is in no way a competitor to evan venice's week in ethereum news seriously read that first click through to the sponsors links is much better but i only write about what i'm interested in and um uh, yep. Uh, and Evan asked about how we discovered uh, Ethereum about four years ago for me. I was working for a very traditional company doing kind of fintech stuff, uh, head of engineering role. One day, all our sales people started coming back and saying, uh, Ben, our customers only want to talk about one thing, uh, something called blockchain. Can you find out what it is? Um, and so I did and uh, looked at Bitcoin, thought, yeah, interesting, but not interesting. And then found Ethereum and mind blown hooked instantly so so my next question was actually going to be like when you wake in the, up in the morning what makes you excited to work on this stuff and i mean it's a little bit of a variation on the on the on the on the background question um but um i don't know this this it's 8 a.m here so this this question could go well or it could go <laughs> very poorly we'll say <laughs> And I like the melee format, so just jump in if you, if you, if you, you know, whoever has the most burning desire to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Is this going to work, Evan? Or you I need to nominate someone. <laughs> but <laughs> let me, let me go. I, I'm, I'm not a, I'm not a huge visionary, right? I'm not sort of, you know, I can't be quite interested if we could change the world and all that kind of stuff. But I, I'm not, you know, Joe, Joe Lubin visionary. I'm more interested in. Um, the the day to day stuff and um, the community is just awesome. I mean, I just love working with these guys, the broader community, uh, communicating the energy um, uh, that, that's around, uh, just everybody helping each other out and making progress and delivering something, which is extraordinary. Um, that, that's what 
gets me uh, gets me going every day. Anyone I'll I'll take it from here. So for me, <laughs> <laughs> for me, it's it's a mixture of our love of the engineering, uh, making the making the product better, discovering new ways to do interesting things. And I think also a bit of a mix of fear uh, that this thing has to work, has to be stable. So uh, every day you got to get up and and keep testing, <laughs> keep building. So love and fear, you know, two most powerful emotions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, for me, I think it's it's really about basically seeing what the people that think ETH2 will never ship will say after we ship. <laughs> um, I think just uh, just seeing seeing it go live, knowing that we have you know these test nets uh, have real people trying it out, seeing nodes actually work and reach consensus, and and really just see all this vision materialize into in real code um, is extremely exciting, right? And and it is every day, I know we get closer and closer to launch. So that's that's really empowering. Yeah, I agree there. It's, it's super exciting to see things materialize. Uh, it's not something like just when you wake up and you think, oh, I want to work on this. It has to go and I want to shift this. It's, as far as like you stay up at night working on all these kind of different things and like it's, it's hard to put away and it keeps you going. So when checking with people, I found that there's a pretty wide range of knowledge around ETH2, even among like Ethereum enthusiasts. Um, so uh, I guess to like sort of create sort of a base layer of you know, knowledge for the people that are that are watching this. Like, where you know, let's just like in your own words, where are we now? And you know, someone can give a good chunk of that, and then people can pick up and fill in the parts that they agree with, disagree with, want to emphasize. Um, ben, how about you? You're the you're the you're the leader on this. <laughs> Uh, yeah, sure. So um, there are three phases of delivery for Ethereum 2. Phase zero is coming. And, you know, I think a common misconception is that that's the, the, the end of the road. It's the beginning of the road. Um, phase zero is just a proof of stake chain that sustains itself uh, and you know, proves the concept. Um, it's coming real soon now. I mean, we're talking months. We're not, uh, you know, weeks to months. Um, test nets are progressing nicely, and I guess we'll get on to that. Um, so we're looking, uh, the official line is Q3 this year, and I'm reasonably 80 to 90% confident that we will land somewhere in, in Q3 for go live of the beacon chain. Somebody want to pick it up from there? That was a bold claim. <laughs> A timeline was yeah, accurate. That's the target. Uh, yeah. yeah. However, we are aware of some client teams. We should talk about testnets and the way the works launch. But there's still a lot in launch. And I'd like to be more careful, more cautious in making these kind of claims. And things like incentivized testnets, uh, making, uh, having five clients on one of the client tests that would be like the ultimate goal. There's still like steps towards that to get ready to like this, this ideal phase zero lunch. Yeah, I, th I think Q3 is, is, is pretty, um, pretty optimistic. I would be expecting Q3 or Q4. <laughs> um, I think the one thing that we're missing is uh, seeing sophisticated malicious actors on test nets. That's something I don't think we've seen yet is people who, who know the protocol, know InfoSec um, and know how to attack these systems. I don't think we've actually had been able to let them loose um, on test nets yet. I think that uh, what they do will be very interesting and very important. I think from where the, the teams are in general on F2 implementation, I think we're seeing teams um, getting quite close to feature complete. There's still a few things that we're missing in terms of um, standard APIs and things like this. Um, but we're seeing client teams having everything they need and running 
almost the, all of the protocols that are required for, um, for F2 mainnet. Um, and now that we have all of these, I think it's time to, to stress test them. So I'm looking forward to moving into this stage. Yeah, for, I think we see also a big misconception is about what's going to happen to ETH1, what do I have to do with my coins, mm -hmm. you know, what, what does this mean to me, um, and, and really just like, there needs to be a lot more uh, critical documentation, and I would say, quote, quote unquote, canonical um, sources of information for this, so maybe better, better information on the Ethereum website itself, um, and just making it very clear kind of what's going to happen um, with the release of phase zero that will help ease a lot of people's concerns. Yeah, it's difficult so telling people that the answer to that question is inferred by four different Python functions. <laughs> yeah. So we currently have this, this Schlezzy testnet up, which has, you know, two clients fully validating on it. And then I guess two more syncing right now. Um, so I guess, are there any learnings that are particularly interesting to talk about? Probably one of the biggest ones. I think it's been interesting. Chelsea, oh, sorry, Paul. Uh, yeah, that Celestia has been, is interesting because um, people expected it to be very unstable and something that, oh, you know, it's barely going to work. Like we're going to have to restart it every week um, and do all these things. But in reality, Celestia has been fairly stable. Um, it's had almost perfect finality, save for sometimes uh, when maybe maybe the operator and the testnet uh, is not, not around that much or um, in general, like more clients have joined and it's still up and running and it's still doing okay. Um, granted, it's just, it's just the beginning, right? So I think it's been surprising that it has been relatively stable for what it is. Yeah, I was going to say that I've been surprised by the value of Afri in the community. I know that he's always been around, but he's been really, really helpful in this, having this um, independent, intelligent person who can raise smart bug reports and, and solve things on their own uh, has been really helpful. And it makes me really uh, confident about the multi-client testnet. So we have someone like Afri um, pushing these things forward. Yeah, totally endorse that. And uh, yeah, I mean, I think my takeaway is that um, interoperability is much harder than single client test nets, right? It's it's just not that challenging to run a test net with just one client. Uh, you can agree with yourself most of the time, but these um, multi-client test nets unearth all sorts of exciting, um, uh, just, yeah, little inconsistencies which um, um, break things. It's It's really interesting. Right, so for multi client test nets, or this one in particular, is seen from the first start, uh, prismatic for the prism client, uh, giving the sync responses that uh, stop early or that rate limit or API alert and otherwise that work fine with move prism to prism, but Lighthouse had trouble with for a little bit, and then resolved it. And we grab, and then it, uh, we have four clients on the test that now. So I think Cloudstar can join as well once their sync improves to handle these kind of sync responses. Uh, and you really see that with these different kind of uh, client implementations with different sync implementations, you, you test all these weird responses you wouldn't otherwise. Yeah, it's kind of like operating in a Byzantine environment. You know, we're, it's as if we're all t attacking each other just because we implement things slightly differently and we've all got to converge on uh, doing things in one way. But it's good because we need to harden each individual client against people who maliciously attack them. So, you know, this is step one. And then as Paul was saying earlier, we need to think about, you know, what happens when people start to come and deliberately break this stuff. So we have, you know, three of you have, have your own clients. I guess it's a good time to ask about, you know, what, what makes your individual client unique? You know, here's a, here's a chance to pitch your client to the people that'll <laughs> be figuring out which client they'll, they'll run. This is, you know, the, the most controversial we can get, right? So go for it. 
Hey, Proto's got a client as well, you know. <laughs> With the best <laughs> <variant> <laughs> <of> <laughs> is called not a client. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had this experiment for a while to sync up those nets. It's like a full network stack implementation and consensus implementation. Uh, however, the sync code is not that advanced, and so it's not really like a client yet. Yet, maybe I can. <laughs> Maybe later. It's um, definitely fun to implement yeah, yeah. Uh, another client. You really have to be suspicious of the person that is openly saying they're not something and wondering when they're going to be that something. We're watching you, Proto. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can tell you what we're focusing on, Lighthouse. Uh, just because we're focusing on these things doesn't mean that the other clients aren't. Um, but some of the th what we're focusing on now is security. So we have an in-house security team. Sigma Prime, so we're, um, we're fuzzing like other teams um, and, and performing, uh, maintaining a fuzzer, a differential fuzzer for the other clients. So we're, we're really paying attention to, um, to security and stability. Um, we're also paying close attention to performance because we know that um, performance means uh, like using less resources means uh, less overhead for stakers, which makes it more attractive to introduce more validators to the chain. Um, so with these security, stability and performance um attributes we're looking forward to being um a good choice for staking um i passed on to the, to the other guys who are probably also focusing on, on similar things and doing a good job i'm sure yeah one of the things that we, we in particular care about at prismatic labs is really the um kind of like the, the devops and the infrastructure behind operating a client so we we manage a fairly sophisticated internal infrastructure for running our testnet um, and we think that, you know, the Prism client learns from this feedback loop of, of running in, in these cloud deployments and making it easy for enter people like, you know, companies or large scale stakers that want to run kind of like, a, you know, a, fa a fairly complex infrastructure to be able to do so with Prism. Um, we have our we have an, an onboarding portal for people to join as validators. So we're also also, also focusing on uh, the regular staker that wants to um, wants to just know how to how to get started and how to put things together. Right. So. Yeah, we, we, we learn a lot from the other client teams. I think every team has their own secret sauce. Uh, and in particular, every time there's like some crazy optimization, like we always look at Lighthouse and we're like, oh, like these guys have this uh, this awesome way of doing fork choice. Like, let's let's see how they do it. Um, so really, it's it's really all about like, you know, kind of what like kind of what 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 the strengths are of each client and being able to keep keep pushing on that and learning from each other to make the other aspects even grow further. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. To a large extent, the client software itself will will converge to you know basically be be quite similar between the the, the different implementations. Um, as for Pegasus, uh, we're playing to our strengths. Um, yeah, I would love to see Teku running on Raspberry Pis across the world, but that's not what we do best. Um, we are an enterprise Ethereum outfit. You know, our DNA is dealing with um, uh, uh, professional. Um, enterprise deployments. So uh, that's the kind of uh, customer that we're targeting for Teku very explicitly, which is um, uh, exchanges, staking pools, um, institutional staking, uh, uh, and so on. So uh, yeah, and that's it's not so much about the client, it's about the, the organization and everything that, that, that surrounds it for us. So I actually, I got a decent number of, of questions um, about, you know, enterprise, and maybe that was who I talked to, but when I was sourcing questions for this panel. Um, so I guess, you know, this is not exactly the world that I think, you know, client implementers live in, but like, what would you tell an enterprise that wants to prep for ETH2? Like, what would you tell them about <laughs> how they should, how they should do it, how they should think about it? <laughs> I would think they need to start focusing, they need to pay attention to the start quantifying rewards and understanding what downtime means and understanding the risks between um, building these complex redundant setups and also just copying some downtime. So something that I've noticed that a lot of people are quite concerned about is, is accepting any uh, penalties at all. Um, so for instance, running like two separate validator client instances with the same um the same key so that if one of them goes down they can be you know back up within within seconds um and i have a stack overflow post about this but you'll find the rewards of being offline for a week is 0.3 percent of your stake 
Um, so you really need to weigh off. Um, and the, the problem is when you have these two sets of keys, you open yourself up to the risk of being slashed, um, which is, I think, half of your stake. Um, so this is, uh, these are like, you really need to, to weigh out the risks and, and look at um, the, the complex, fancy um, solutions and whether or not they are actually a risk to your business or not. And there's a thing too, whether, you know, if everyone decides to not do redundancy, then um, you have this problem where if everyone goes away for on holidays for a week and, you know, someone attacks the network, then no one's going to come back up. So um, you do need to balance off this like thing about being maximally profitable, profit seeking, and then also um, being good for the network. But yeah, I think, I think understanding the risks um, is really important. Yeah, in that sense, uh, risk management is important. Also, this understanding the spec to implement the right precautions and not to make mistakes with this risk management. I think Ben did this really well with the annotated spec. Try and understand every little detail um, and just work uh, to like understand these kind of risks that a client faces when running a lot of validators. Mm. Yeah, a lot of our conversations revolve around kind of co-creation. Um, this is new, right? It's a it's a journey. Nobody has done this before. Now, there's lots of coins out there and lots of staking going on, but not on this scale and not with ETH2 protocols. I mean, it's been well observed that the ETH2 protocol has not been designed for enterprise staking, right? There are lots of things like delegated staking and key rotation and stuff like that, which are just not in the protocol. Um, so that it, and, and I think that's deliberate because it's designed to be maximally decentralized and to not disadvantage the home staker if possible, which is cool. And I, you know, I'm totally with that program. But that means that when designing um, a, an enterprise or institutional setting, some of the kind of common assumptions and, and architectural designs just don't apply. And we need to work to um, uh, implement it effectively. Uh, for organizations. Um, and one thing we're doing is we're building a kind of slashing protector uh, component. It's kind of like the converse of Prismatic Labs slashing uh, detector um, in that it will refuse to sign things if, if they're going to get validator slashed. So, you know, that, that's a, a component that, that we, we will be providing uh, to help guarantee stuff. Cool. I think uh, people shouldn't be afraid yeah, for, to reach out to we, the client team either. Yeah, for sure. Like we, we speak to also a few companies that are looking to just kind of jump into E2. And one of the main things they, they always wonder is, you know, when's a good time to get started? How do I actually get started? Like, are there test nets? Or is there anything I can do? Um, and I think like for us, like we, we've had a public API that is accessible to them. Uh, we had a test net that's, you know, been on, been on a, Etherscan and, and Bitflies, Block Explorers, and having having these tools and give people more confidence that, oh, like I can actually play around with this and actually try to spin up a few nodes. So we've had a fair amount of uh, fair amount of uh, companies uh, really just uh, join uh, the test nets um, and giving them confidence that, hey, like this is this is real and you can try it today um, has given us a fantastic feedback loop. Like they, consist they consistently provide bug reports or feature fixes. Um, so, yeah. yeah, I was just saying that pe pe uh, people shouldn't be afraid to reach out to the client teams. We have our discords and these kind of feel like places where uh, we are kind of geared, I guess, for our developers to talk to us. But um, I know uh, Secret Prime where we're definitely open to, to people talking to us. Um, you know, we we manage information security um, assessments, um, you know, professional professional services firm. Um, so you can engage with us like you would uh, any other enterprise firm. Um, and all you need to do is just reach out. So jumping around a little bit here, um, how long should we run the test net before we go live? And how many clients do we need to go to go live? <laughs> For 
three days, one client. <laughs> YOLO. <laughs> I, I think two to three months. Um, and it depends on uh, how it goes when we start introducing sophisticated malicious actors into the test net. Um, and we can play it by ear. Um, but I would say two to three months is roughly what I would think is reasonable. Um, and I think at an absolute bare minimum, it's, it's two clients. You know, it's the thing is like two is one of the interesting numbers in math because it's, you know, it's not zero, it's not one. Um, but I would like to see, uh, I think three would be, would be like at least three would be nice. Two, absolute minimum, three would be nice. More is great. Yeah, I'd like to see as many as possible, um, partly because uh, finality depends on having at least a third of the clients uh, or two thirds of the clients online. Um, so if one client you know, has a bug which is fatal for a period of time then uh, and has over a third of the network, then uh, finality will cease um, for a period of time, which is not disastrous, but it's not desirable either. So, um, and the only way to achieve that is to have plenty of clients and plenty of diversity. Yeah, not just diversity, but also compatibility. So if you're able to uh, have a fall over, like a fallback to switch from, uh, say, Nimbus, to Lodestar, some like any any client combination, uh, like having a way to export import keys, uh, having a way or understanding of which federated clients work uh, with which big amounts, uh, that kind of thing also helps to like be sure that once you run in a mainnet setting, you are able to stay online even if in uh, a case of disaster. Yeah, I think two definitely need to be feature complete. Uh, three is probably what's going to happen uh, due to the stringent requirements. Um, yeah, we need we need two to three months, and that's the three month period. A lot of testing, and it with regards to um, different network configurations. So we might we'll be running also smaller tests on the side that have maybe like shorter times between blocks, uh, for example. Um, have like maybe a larger validator count. Have all these extreme cases that we can be testing while we have a stable. Uh, public multi-client. So we don't have that much yeah, on the time client left, kind of thing too. Yeah. I think. Sorry, there you go. Go ahead. I was just going to say on the client kind of thing. I think people should be running um, different clients to um, to make sure that the network is diverse uh, and also to allow themselves to figure out which one works better for them, uh, which one's making their values more profit, which one's using more resources. Which one's less annoying? I, I got a lot of questions from App, Appler developers who want to know how to plan for ETH2. Do you have any interesting words to, um, you know, I don't know, I think people fear the unknown, so maybe narrow the zone of uncertainty for some of the, you know, application does um, yeah I mean I don't think that becomes relevant for a quite a little while yet so um, the longer term roadmap phase one we put shard chains on uh, eth2 which is just data chains um, not execution um, it's possible to build applications on top of that but not applications like we know today um, and then the next step is is almost certainly to fold eth1 into eth2 there's been a bit of a reprioritization of roadmap in the, over the last few months and there's a lot higher emphasis on getting uh, today's eth1 or eth1x you know uh, what we have today plus some um, upgrades uh, into ETH2, turn off proof of work and unify the two systems. That's driven by all sorts of considerations, partly exactly answering your question, Evan, which is making the app developers more comfortable and having a nice smooth transition, but also kind of regulatory things like, you know, making sure that ETH is ETH on both chains and, and never diverges, right? So that uh, um, we can, um, all the staked ETH that becomes um, 
movable at the same time as eth1 joins eth2 which which seems important so and at that point then that's a starting place to start building out into putting other kinds of execution on eth2 but uh, and there, there'll be a lot of changes under the hood to eth1 clients but they shouldn't be very visible to dap developers that's the goal as as i understand it proto may be able to speak uh, uh, in a more informed way about this yeah so regarding uh, the development like application development is really about smart contracts right now and defi um phase zero is about staking and like this just like the system layer right and it takes some time to upgrade the system layer uh with data and then execution and then we'll have even version and kind of combine with these two Do you all want to touch this one? I, uh, I feel like... Yeah, I was just going to say, I think if if developers, so DAP developers, I assume we're talking about people that are writing smart contracts and like for said DeFi stuff. Um, I would say these people, it's not quite ready. It's not quite time for you to be concerned. You, if you if you don't know how everything works, then that's fine. Um, the the APIs are not standardized. Um, the things that you're dealing with are not are not finalized yet. Um, so don't be anxious that you don't know everything yet. Um, perhaps you can get across the core protocol to understand what the data structure looks like with the blocks and the chain. Um, but yeah, you, you, you're not like, no one's expecting you to understand everything yet. Um, if you're building staking and core F2 beacon chain stuff, it's probably time to start getting involved and getting getting involved with the API standardization efforts that's happening. Um, but if you're, if you're a smart contract developer, then you can, you know, it's probably best to focus on the security of your current smart contracts than to try and learn about what's happening on F2 at this present moment. It's a jungle out there. Yeah, same sentiment. Everyone. So Ethereum is an open source project and, you know, anybody can contribute, um, I guess, you know, what would you say to someone who wants to contribute um, to and where can they contribute to what you're working on? There's the typical, you know, go on the Discord or go on the GitHub and, you know, file issues and contribute and stuff like this. Um, that's good for you know some people. I think what's really important is people writing articles to um, make small parts of the spec to be digestible um, by non-technical people because it's all very technical at the moment. Um, you know, join the test nets. Um, we're also working on uh, kind of making our fuzzer. So a fuzzer, it's a security tool. It throws random inputs to clients and see if they either explode or start to disagree with each other. Um, so you know, the more random inputs we can throw at it, the more we test. So we're working to. Uh, make it so anyone can download this and run the fuzzer on their machine and maybe find some F2 bugs. So we'll announce that one soon. Yeah, for, for us, I think the biggest thing is really we want people that uh, consider themselves beginners and want to try staking. Like they're, you know, they have some technical competency or maybe little technical competency and they just, they want to get started. So we talk, take them to our, our onboarding portal for our testnet, we'll try to get them as validators. And uh, we really asked them like, hey, what was the tough part of the experience? Like what, w like, what didn't you understand um, when you're running the client? If there was any problem, like how did you feel about it? Like how, how, you know, how would you like to make it more digestible? Um, and through that, we've had uh, a lot of incredible contributions, especially to our documentation portal. We've had uh, users come in and, and basically give full Windows support to running the client. It was really cool. Um, we've had people come in and, and run like slashing and catch slashing. Um, so overall, just really improving the knowledge base, uh, really making it easy for the regular person. Um, we have even had people come up and create amazing dashboards for monitoring their validator, which is completely made by them, you know, for fun. So um, really, we want these people that are just getting started um, to tell us what is difficult about the experience. And, and, and that's and, and typically they are motivated to make it better. So we guide them towards that process. Mm. 
Yeah, I totally endorse uh, all of that. I mean, I started out by saying, uh, you know, what gets me going in the morning is a community. And this is what we're talking about is, you know, people coming along and uh, joining in and making contributions. And, you know, I started my Ethereum journey with a couple of extremely uh, uh, lame um, pull requests to... Um, uh, it was a solidity compiler, <laughs> as it happens, but um, you know, and it, and, it, and it grew from there. But no, no team will, will turn you away if your if your contribution is at all uh, valuable or, or useful, um, and you'll be welcomed, and people will spend time. Um, and uh, don't be shy. Um, I will endorse about writing. There's plenty of scope. I mean, there's you know, I, I deal with this on a kind of weekly basis, trying to order the information out there and put it into some digestible form. Um, there's a lot of stuff that is just kind of slightly chaotic at the moment and could really do with some help uh, ordering and communicating and and putting on a on a solid footing as well. So yeah, come and join in and run validators and report back if you find. If you find issues, don't just stop. Don't just give up. Report the issues to the teams, please, because that's super helpful. Right. And then, reminder, we have three client teams here on the call. There are more. So there, um, if you have, like, many languages, uh, and also not just client development, but tooling, like these things around the clients as well. There's uh, a lot you can try and create a little pull request for or start getting involved. Awesome. Well, I think we had a great time talking about ProcPal. Thank you. <laughs> My favorite ProcPal is proof of stake. <laughs> Seconded. <laughs>